Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show, where we bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers, and other newsmakers from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest today is Paul Lazarus, who is a director, producer, writer, uh, who has just produced his documentary on Dean Kamen called Slingshot that premiered at the San Jose Cinequest Film Festival. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Slingshot. When you think of Slingshot, you think of David and Goliath, and that's what this film is fundamentally, and it addresses a fundamental problem that we all are facing, not here in the U.S., maybe in California, water. How did you come up with this idea to make this documentary? I've been working with Dean Kamen for 30 years, uh, practically, on all sorts of other documentaries about his first robotics and Segway, which was called Ginger. And when he told me in 2006 about his work on water, I said to him, this is a story well, very well, much worth telling from the beginning to the end. Let's start shooting now and cover this. You've already been working on it for over a decade, even before we started. And I wanted to see if it was possible to put an audience inside the head of, what does it take to have a brilliant idea like this, make the technology and see that it gets distributed? And I just thought that would be a fascinating movie, along with the fact that he's an extraordinarily compelling character in his own right. And so I thought if I could combine those two things, I could help disseminate the technology, which is really my principal goal was, how do you get this technology out into the world where it does some good? I think a story might be able to help that and a film might be able to help that. So that was the prime motivation. I guess you succeeded brilliantly because through the film, you show what came in struggles with, that innovation is a frustrating and difficult process, as he himself points out. And, uh, but he doesn't give up. Uh, and you've known him for 30 years. Why do you think he doesn't give up? That's, that's the secret of Dean Kamen. He's indefatigable. He is, uh, it remains an optimist when other people give up. And uh, I think the extraordinary measure of this man is that once he wants to try to do something, he just doesn't give up. And, and I, I, don't think I've, I don't think I've ever seen him give up he, he, in my entire association with him. And the fact that he keeps going against all odds is what's extraordinary about him. That's, and I think it's what's inspiring to us to watch a man like that who just, in the face of the most insurmountable obstacles, never gives up. He, he's, you know, he's, like, he's like a pit bull. Once the jaws are on, they're never going to be unclenched and, uh, until he solves it. He, he once said to me, you know, maybe this isn't the best idea of how to clean water, but until somebody else comes along with a better idea, I'm going to keep doing it. So for those of us... I've seen the film. I guess I was lucky to see the first, maybe one of the first persons to see. What does Slingshot do and why is it important? Yes, it's, it is trying to solve a huge global problem, water. But what is so different about what he's doing and how he's doing? That's a, a really good question. There are many, many important forms of water remediation. And by water remediation, I mean taking bad water and turning it into good. There are many, many good solutions. But what's special about Slingshot is you can put any form of bad water, poison well water, uh, ocean water, arsenic-laden well water from India, which where that's a big problem. You can put any form of water in this machine. It goes through the process that Dean has invented and, and many, many people have worked on. And it turns into potable, injectable-grade water, distilled water. And what's extraordinary is that a, you don't need to test the water before you put it in, and you most especially don't need to test the water after it comes out. Every form of every solution to the world's water crisis, basically to this machine, requires pre-testing and post-testing. Because if you don't know what's going in, you don't know how to fix it, and if you don't test it after, you're not sure it's safe. The difference here is that Dean knows you put any liquid content in a machine, you can give it with complete confidence to anybody, and it's safe. That, that in itself is such a remarkable change. Many people call it the silver bullet because it's the one process that is guaranteed to work. But the other really big thing, and this is harder to explain, is it's all about power consumption. Distillation, which is the process, it's a vapor compression distiller. Distillation requires enormous amounts of energy. This like box, like the sun, this box is going to places where they don't have enormous amounts of energy other than the sun. They don't have electricity, they don't have solar power, they don't have anything. So how do you put a box like that anywhere you have to solve the power problem? What Dean has done is by recycling the power 
And that's the simplest way for me to explain it. The power isn't just going in and thrown away. The power is going in, recycling, 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 recycling. It's just a continuous cycle. By changing the by changing the notion of distillation to be about put a little bit of power in, power in, and then keep using it, he's reduced the needs of a typical machine like this would require the power of 20 homes. He's reduced it to the power of a handheld hair dryer, one kilowatt. That's, that breakthrough is the true genius of this machine because you don't need a lot of power. So hopefully there'll be a day where these are operated by solar power or they're operated by... Um, any kind of power that we can make up. That, that's, to me, the really special aspect. So iteration is something that he does constantly. And he debuted this in 2006. You have a scene there with Kobe himself, Stephen Kobe, you know, asking him. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to come back to this question, only because it is so hard to be focused in, at, at, at such an intense level, for want of a better word, I'm going to use the word intense. How does he do it? You, f you spent six years filming this, and so you have seen him do it. How does he do it? Does he, does he ever say this is not going to... I mean, how does he do it? That's all I want to know. I've tried to ask him that same question. Um, he, he doesn't sleep. <laughs> he doesn't eat. He doesn't change into clothing like anybody else does. He saves time everywhere he can. That, he, he appears to be eccentric because he wears... Uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's not about eccentricity as much as just conscious decision. I don't believe Dean, I think Dean once told me he's been in a shopping food store twice in his entire life. Now, there's nobody more intense than this man. He's making decisions. If I take time to go shopping, and some people even enjoy food shopping, right? If I take time, then that takes time away from saving people's health or giving them kidney dialysis. So he doesn't do those things. He doesn't get up in the morning and choose clothing because that's a waste of time. If you just put on jeans and a jean shirt every day, you save time. If you, if you want to get somewhere quickly, you learn how to fly a helicopter. And, and if you have the resources to buy a helicopter, you put it in your house, you take it out by yourself and you fly to wherever you need to go. And if you need to have three meetings in one day, you do it in your plane. He goes to meetings in Ohio like you go to San Francisco. He, 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 this, he's efficient beyond anything we can imagine. He uses his time like nobody you've ever met. And that's how he, but that doesn't really answer your question, but that's one of the ways he succeeds at answering your question. The real answer is, I believe that he knows he has the capacity to do these mind-boggling things. What if you, what if, remember that line, what if, what if you could do anything you imagined? Well, he's kind of that guy. So if you had the responsibility of that, maybe you would be as intense as Dean can. I don't know if it's so much the responsibility. When you read up about his life, he didn't complete uh, college, and uh, he had a father who worked for Mad Magazine, and you know, you have a clip there where his father tells him, if you like something, you will work, you know? And so it looks, it's that little child in all of us that we have lost. We all, when we are young, we have dreams about what we want to do. But here is a man who has actually achieved it. He said, when I was little, I wanted to build a house and open a glass door, go out and, you know, fly away in my helicopter. He does that. He wanted secret. So it's this little child with this innate curiosity that's in all of us. I'm wondering why he never lost it. Yeah, well, I, I think that's right. I think somehow he's maintained the spirit of change and innovation that little kids always demonstrate. Little kids never have trouble playing because they can take a cardboard box and it becomes anything they want it to be. Somehow Dean has been able to retain that with all of the troubles that he faces. He's retained that spirit and I believe that that spirit is how he looks at patients on kidney dialysis and goes, we're asking the wrong question. The question isn't how to make this machine better. The question is this person doesn't have a working kidney and why don't I let them do it at home while they're sleeping? He asks a different question, and then he solves it. And then he also has, he'll be the first to admit that he has 400 really smart people that take his ideas and help him realize them. All those people in that room are helping the Slingshot Project, and Dean, I think, would be the first to admit he's certainly the conductor of the symphony, but there's a lot of great instrumentalists. And this Slingshot, what it does is, uh, as uh, he says in the film, uh, 50% of the world's health problems are due to waterborne uh, pathogens. And basically, he's kept with his 
large idea of helping people, especially in the healthcare area. And that's what keeps him going, huh? Imagine that when you were a teenager, you built a, something called an auto syringe and you gave it to your brother, the doctor, and he, you were able to get medicines into babies, you know, who had, you know, postnatal, prenatal conditions. And, and you succeeded at that as a teenager. Imagine what that would do to you at, in your 60s, what you're capable of. And that's who Dean Kamen is. You know, he's been doing this his whole life. He doesn't take vacations. He calls them the V word because he can't imagine sitting on a beach lounging because why would you do that? This, this is who we're talking about. Very austere. Yeah, it's a pretty austere, but, but, he, he's, but he, you saw in the movie, he's got a tremendously developed sense of humor. He, I don't think this is work for him. On some level, this is joy. This is, it, it's, of course, work, and it's, of course, incredibly hard work. And when the UN turns you down and the Bill Gates Foundation turns you down and everybody turns you down, it can't be fun. It's, I, much, I imagine it's hard to be, stay the child at those moments. But somehow, he, he just keeps going. You know, I, I, I don't think I know the answer to how he keeps There's going. There's a shot again in the film where you show, he says, people have artwork in the foyer, and I have machines. And he says, I'm afraid of animals, but not of machines. And he's got the steam engine, which powered the tugboat. And uh, I was thinking, I wonder if this thought went through your mind. The name of the tugboat was called Oscar. What, what, I'm not sure what the question is, though. Oscars and Oscars. Oh, oh, oh. I, see, I didn't, even, I didn't even catch the connection. Until, uh, no, you know what? I, 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 it's much... Th thank you. That's a lovely question. I, I, um, I have to say, uh, you know, if, if I were making a movie to get an Oscar, I wouldn't do what I've done. I, I, I've made this movie because uh, I believe in this man, I believe in this technology, and if somebody wants to give us a prize and more people will see the movie and, and have their minds change, terrific. Other than that, uh, it would be nice to break even on the movie because I've been, uh, you know, I've put a lot of time into this, but uh, that's really, it's not, that's not my focus, you know. I, no, but you know what's funny? Until you said that, it's not even occurred to me. It's literally not occurred to me, but now, I, now I'll never see that boat again without thinking. But, uh, but, but no, it's not, because uh, uh, the prizes are nice, the reaction in the audience is better. Has his infection rubbed off to you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you don't work on something for seven years unless the, the uh, infection has rubbed off, yeah, big time. Yeah, he, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, and I'm not a particularly political person, but on, when it comes to water, I have just become this rabidly political human being. And I think it's because when you have knowledge and you bite the apple, you change because you didn't realize. I don't, there's, we're just walking around in America and running our taps and taking our showers. I don't really believe we understand what's going on. Well, we're going to know soon. And when we do, it's going to be a big wake-up call. Don't you think in California we know? In California, the, we're, we're, we're very aware of farmers fighting for water and drought and, and I mean I there's a shot in the movie that I shot two weeks ago and it's driving down a, a LA highway and there's a sign that says serious drought please save water that I put that shot in the movie I made it two weeks ago it's right now what's happening and uh, yeah I think but I sadly I think there's a lot of people in that audience today that were woken up I think or at least I hope um, I don't think we know all that much about it just yet I think it's going to kind of hit us like a tsunami. Manchester is where his companies are located, all that he does. Has he ever thought of the word Manchester because it was the first city in the world that went industrial? That's very interesting. Um, I don't know. You know, you know, Dean endlessly surprises me with his knowledge, but he's never said that to me, but that's a really fun point. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. You know, what I, I, what I do know is that he went to New Hampshire because he liked the license plate saying live free or die, and frankly, there's, a, um, there's no income tax, I think. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, Dean is a very shrewd businessman, and he goes to, you know, he knows how much money he's spending on these inventions, and he's a very, very smart guy. You also have a connection with New Hampshire. You went to Dartmouth, and just like uh, Dean came in, you've also kept your abiding interest uh, right from your childhood. You danced, you sang, you acted in Oliver Twist. So you've done all those things, and you did that at Dartmouth too. Then you went across the pond and you interned at the Royal Shakespeare Theater. So it looks like you have some of what Dean Kamen has too. Well, that's very complimentary. I, I, uh, 
I've been a director for 30 years, pretty much all I know. I try to do things that uh, typically entertain people. This one, I hope, will uh, inform and entertain people at the same time and possibly inspire them. How do you put this against Melrose Place? I, it's uh, apples and oranges, you know. Melrose Place is fun and uh, not very meaningful, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and this is meaningful and not, not much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for your time.